What is going on everybody? Welcome back to the base channel and another installment of Gibson A Go Go. Probably a stupid name, but I like alliterations. So last time we talked about the differences of this SG base and my older 2015 SG base, and I alluded to a couple issues that I had with this when it arrived. Um, so I thought this would be a good opportunity to not only share with you those issues, but also kind of give my opinion on some of the reputation that Gibson has garnered in the last couple years uh, about their QC or their quality control. So I got this from Billy at Sounds with the full on intent of turning this into a fretless because over the last maybe year or two, I've been really romanticizing the idea of, of modding different SG bases into wildly different things. So obviously one of them is gonna be a fretless. Uh, somewhere down the line, I might do like three Music Man pickups, like just crazy wild stuff, kind of in the hopes that one day Gibson acknowledges it and kind of updates their baseline because as cool as this is, we've seen it. Um, I'm sure next year will be identical. So it'd be really fun for them to get uh, a little bit more adventurous with their baseline, try to make them a little bit more palatable for more styles of players, and just have a little fun with it. Um, I was wildly disappointed with the Gene Simmons signature. I was hoping for a grabber or something, uh, but we got a Thunderbird, and we got a Thunderbird with just a red pickguard, and that's kind of it, and the red binding, like, at least put EMGs in it, like Gene uses EMGs live, so, but no, it's just, the only difference seems to be aesthetic. Um, I haven't played one yet, so I don't know for sure. Hopefully we'll get one soon. But anyway, point being, uh, I wanna do a project where I mod one of these a year. So this one came in the mail and I pull it out of the case, which by the way, this is the case. Pretty cool, I like it better than the 2015 uh, rectangular gold case. Got the pink interior. Awesome case, love it. But it had a couple issues when I pulled it out. Um, they were minor issues and they were purely cosmetic issues. It, it, it played great, it was in tune, it was set up well, the action was fine, that was all good. Nothing was broken. Uh, the most glaring problem um, was the fretboard was in desperate need of some TLC. It was dried out and dehydrated, which means the same thing, but hey, there's another word for you. And uh, just kind of looked ashy. Like, like it's a rosewood fretboard, clearly, uh, but it didn't look rose. Here's a picture of it. This was the day that I got it. And then the second thing, while we're on the neck, uh, somewhere kind of in this upper register here, above the 12th fret, there were a couple frets that had some like, what looked like dried glue residue. Again, cosmetic, pretty easy to take care of. Uh, I hit it with a cloth and then the, the more stubborn ones, I just took a little 4 out steel wool and just kind of hit it up and, you know, I was able to kind of clean the frets up a little bit too, not that they were dirty, but hey, doesn't hurt. So uh, I took the strings off, took care of the glue, put uh, a pretty gratuitous amount of the Dunlop 65 lemon oil uh, that people seem to be pretty conflicted on. Some people swear by it, some people swear never to use it ever. It worked for me. Uh, I put more on than I normally would and let it sit a little bit longer than I normally would and it whipped it right into shape. I mean, check it out, it looks, it looks great now. Um, so that was the first problem. Second problem, again, and I, that's maybe a little too harsh of a word, uh, but one kind of issue that I have with Gibson a little bit, as much as I love Gibson, um, sometimes they painfully stick to traditions. My favorite example is there is no reason that this tilt back headstock doesn't have a volute, other than that's not how they did it in the 50s. Um, so I would love to see the volute. But anyway, point being, uh, this pickup, being painfully rooted in tradition is kind of loose in that cover. There's a very poor excuse of a thin piece of foam underneath, but when you pull this out of the case and either hit a note or shake it, uh, you can hear that pickup loose in there and it just rattles around. So again, popped the cover off, took one of my EMG pickup boxes and, and stuck a heavy, thick piece of foam under there, screwed it back on, and now, nothing. So again, that was about a two minute fix that cost me nothing. And then the final issue, uh, the bridge pickup, the screw on this, this corner, this top right, right to your perspective, uh, was just slightly loose. Um, it wasn't falling off or anything. It took about two turns of the screwdriver and it was nice and snug yet again. So for about 10 extra minutes, zero extra dollars and minimal effort, uh, this base was back where it needed to be. 
Now that brings us to the question of Gibson's quality control. Why would they let an instrument that costs approximately 1600 US dollars leave the factory in that condition? Well, I don't think that they did. So if you ever bought a Gibson or if you ever owned one that was you know, used but still fairly new where it came with all the case candy, you'll know that you get this little QC checklist. So pop it open and somebody has went and checked all of this stuff by hand. They've dated it. They've wrote the model number, the serial number, they've signed it and so the guy who inspected it and the guy who packed it, they're two different people. I can't read the first name, but the second name is Jay Sweetman. Sweet man. All right. So my point is you get the checklist hand checked and you get what they uh, refer to as the baby photo. I'm just going to take a picture of this and then put it on the screen big so I don't have to hold it like this. But if you look closely at this photo on the day that it left the factory, which, fun fact, was October 26th of 2021, Josh's wedding day. Uh, you'll notice that the fretboard looks great. I don't see any dried glue uh, in the upper register, and I can't tell on that bridge pickup ring whether that's loose or not, but I'm going to just go ahead and guess that it probably wasn't. Uh, because, again, if you're going to go through this trouble and this trouble, you're not gonna go through the extra four seconds it takes to tighten a screw down. I find that unlikely. So here is my, I guess, theory. I don't know, I feel like there's a little bit more proof than other traditional theories out there. Um, I think it's less about Gibson's QC and more about the retailer, right? So maybe you have a guitar center in your neighborhood or a some other store, right? If you don't maintain the instrument, then of course it's gonna, like any instrument, it's gonna have problems. You know, you're gonna get sharp frets, you're gonna get dried out fretboards, you're gonna get dead strings, you're gonna get tuning issues, what have you. Um, since I moved to Vegas, where I used to live, it was a higher humidity here, it's a lower humidity. Most of my instruments have sharp fret ends. Uh, I, that's just on me, I gotta go take them and, and get it handled, but I just I haven't, I haven't gotten to it yet. So my point being, if Gibson is not for you, that's cool, that's totally fine, hopefully, if you're here, you're, you're into them, you like them, you dig the vibe and you like the feel. I personally love the feel more than anything. Not that the tone is bad, but you know, I like a bunch of different tones for different things. I'm not always locked into just what this does, but I like the feel. I like them in my hand. There's just something about Gibson's that to me, they feel at home. I'm not saying that they're the best instrument ever. Um, they may not work for you. You know, some people say Fender's the best instrument ever and that's cool if you like fenders then do by all means play a fender i don't particularly like them in my hands i love listening to other people play them whether it be the basses or the guitars i particularly don't like the guitars but i don't get along with the p bass that well either so this just happens to be my sauce if you don't like something that's totally fine just know why you don't like it instead of relying on what might be misinformation or exaggerated information from some guy that you met once or somebody on a forum post, you know, who says, oh, I played a, I played a this and this and action was all, but that's just that guy's or person. Sorry, it's 2022. That's just that person's experience. Um, not that they're lying, that, that could have very well been their experience, but that doesn't mean that's gonna be your experience. So my, I guess what I'm trying to say is just get out there and try it, you know, like I could see I could see somebody with that one star Yelp mentality getting this instrument that I got and being completely outraged because yes, I get I get one side of the coin. If I'm gonna drop $1,600, give or take, uh, I want this perfect out of the box. And you know, that's a fair point. So just write a letter to your local music retailer. Um, with this one, I, I sincerely doubt that it was a floor unit. Uh, it might, it may have been when I got the box, the box was sealed. It looked like it had never been touched, but at the same time, it had never been touched. Uh, it was just in a case, in a box, probably in a warehouse in God knows where, uh, just not being loved. And so that's probably going to account for some of the dried out fretboard and whatever else, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know about the pickup ring. I have no idea. Um, but either way, they were easy fixes. The bass wasn't broken. The bass wasn't not set up properly, it holds a tune great, you know, like the stuff that matters, there was no issue. 
no issue in those departments. It was purely aesthetic, purely cosmetic, and purely very easy to fix. So I guess for Gibson's sake, it's good that I'm not the one star Yelper kind of person. <laughs> you know, I try to find the good and stuff. Um, but just for fun, what else do you get for your 1600 bucks? So like I said, you get the hard case, you get a strap, probably never gonna use it, but I appreciate the thought, thank you very much. Uh, you get these things that you're not allowed to eat, which is a shame. Uh, these, I think these are the keys to the case. And then you get this uh, little Ziploc bag, which in there is a multi-tool. Oh, the multi-tool is pretty cool. Uh, you got your warranty card to fill out, and then you've got a polishing cloth. All right, a little polishing cloth in there. So, so here's where I kind of dangerously maybe get into the space of I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm not a luthier, not a guitar builder, not even a guitar tech, never built one. Hardly know what goes into it outside of wood and some wire and some metal. But here's the thing. And again, we're going back to, you gotta, you gotta make sure this is your vibe, right? Obviously this probably isn't gonna work for your 80s cover band. Um, but the one that I like to go to is the, is the Schecter SLS Elite. That base is 1500, we'll call it $1,500, right in that neighborhood. So this is, is just a smidge more, but, but in the same general price ballpark, right? One of them is made in America. The other one, which I don't have, I couldn't, <laughs> I don't have, so I can't put it on my lap, uh, is made in Indonesia, Korea. Oh, we'll, we'll call it overseas. Um, approximately the same price. The Schecter's got plenty of bells and whistles. Uh, it's got the Fishman electronics. It's got two band active EQ. It's got the three way switch for the different voicings. It's got a push pull for humbucker and uh, single coil. I don't know why I blanked on the word single coil. Humbucker and single coil. Uh, it's made of like seven different woods. I forget the exact spec. Here's Chuck's video on the take five of it. You can, if you want to know all the woods that went into making that bass, you can find out there. This uh, is one wood. It's one outdated mud bucker in the wrong position. Um, you know, people like it in the sweet spot. Uh, and, a, and a mini humbucker. It, uh, it's unapologetically unusable for many applications and you know, on one hand, you got to kind of give it up for it. But here's, here's the difference, right? In my opinion, sure, you can have all the fancy tonal options. You can have all the different woods that go into making it. But there's something about just when it's, I don't know, for maybe it's me. Maybe I just, maybe I'm out of my mind. I have no idea. But when I sit here with an instrument and it's not even plugged in, this is how I shop too. When I go to stores to look at instruments and they ask me if I want to plug it in, it's like, no, I don't care how it sounds. I wanna know how it feels because the way I feel it in my left hand, the way I feel it in my chest, if I'm sitting in my lap and the whole deal, if I can get a good vibe on how the instrument resonates, like how much do I feel that note in the headstock? How much do I feel that note in my thumb? If I can get a good read on those things, I kinda sorta know what it's gonna sound like. And then obviously I got experience with, I know what single coils sound like, I know what buckers sound like, I know what P basses sound like. I got a good general idea of whether I'm gonna get along with this thing or not, or if this thing sounds good to my ears or not. So this instrument in my hands, eyes closed, unplugged, just playing stupid nonsense like this, there's something about this instrument that just resonates with a higher caliber and quality than the Schecter does. Sure, the Schecter is way more impressive on paper. It's probably more versatile for your 80s cover band gig or whatever cover band gig you might have. Shucks is 90s. Um, and again, if, if that's your sauce and that's that's the tool that suits your job, then by all means, get it. I'm not, I, I'm not saying go out and buy this. I'm just saying give it a shot. If you see one in the wild, pick it up and play it. Um, and you know, it might be for you. You might still walk away with your exact same opinion, whether that be good or bad, but you might walk away with a changed one. I know for me, I used to also, like a lot of people out there, bag on Gibson, complain about the price, play the Guitar Center ones in that horrendous condition. And I used to lie to myself that they were worse and lie to myself that I didn't want them. And it was predominantly because I couldn't, it was 90% because I couldn't afford it. 
if I would have learned to just stop buying cheap instrument after cheap instrument to where you have 12 cheap instruments, if I would have just waited and not given in to the instant gratification, just waited and put the money away and bought something that was quality, that could be a legitimate investment, I would have been much happier when I was 20 years old. Um, 12 years later, I've figured it out. So now I know I don't, I don't mess with the Korean stuff and the Indonesian stuff. Every once in a while, you get a good one. You know, there's like with the Dingwall, you know, those are pretty cool. But even with the, even with the Dingwall, the NG2, the D-Rock, those instruments have a vibe and a tone and a sound and a thing, and, and they're awesome for what they are. I'm not trying to say anything bad about Dingwall, but when I'm sitting here like this, I can feel in my left hand that that is an overseas instrument. I don't know what that is. I don't, I don't know how to describe it. Luthiers, please jump in, and if you're out there, let me know what, I, what phenomenon I'm experiencing. Um, but there's just something about this instrument that just feels solid. And maybe that's another, uh, a little bit of the reason why some of them feel so different. I bought uh, a 2016 SG standard guitar one time. Um, and there were two identical models hanging next to each other. I played them both and I picked the one I picked on purpose because it felt better than the other one. Um, that store had a pretty respectable and good, you know, talented uh, guitar tech luthier, Fabio Montes. So I'm pretty sure that didn't come down to neglect. Uh, he had most of those instruments in there banging at any given time, but that one just seemed to feel better. So I don't know, you know, just because something is called a certain type of wood, is it really that type of wood? You know, like, you know, it's like how like Hershey's chocolate is labeled as chocolate, but it's, it's more milk than chocolate. Uh, I wonder if that's a similar thing. Um, you know, when, when certain companies have bases for $800 with ebony fretboards and my question is is it really ebony or are you allowed to call a wood that is a certain shade darker than a specific hue ebony be based on the color because ebony is a wood and ebony is a color I question those things I, I honestly I don't know um, I'm not trying to throw any kind of nonsense at any company or put anybody down I'm, I'm genuinely curious is that a thing uh, just because something says maple I've felt maple boards that felt incredibly cheap and I've felt maple boards that felt incredibly high end and really resonant and dense and just solid. Um, but this is one of those ones. This isn't maple, this is mahogany, but it just feels incredibly dense and solid and high quality. Um, not obviously not heavy, but you know, I mean, look, I'm not trying to kiss anybody's ass. I'm not. I'm not trying to tell you to go out and buy a Gibson. I'm not doing any of that. I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that these series can just be a space where I can talk about the things that I like. And if you like them, you can join in and add your two cents. I really hope this doesn't become a, he's selling out and shilling for Gibson. You know, like nobody paid me to say any of this stuff. Uh, this is just genuinely what I believe. And I've always said what I believe, but I just, I, I like this company. I don't know too much about the politics. I don't know, I don't get into that. I don't care. Uh, I don't care who they're suing and what's going on with that. I just, again, eyes closed, unplugged. This thing is for me. The T-Bird is for me. The G3 is for me. They're, they're all for me. Not that I dislike other things. I'm just saying this feels like home. So thank you for listening to my almost coherent ramblings uh, about my thoughts on Gibson's QC and American-built instruments in general. Uh, again, I'm sure there's plenty of political stuff I could have gone into about buying American-made stuff. I'm not gonna do it because I don't understand it enough to talk about it on camera. So, uh, this is the second episode in a row with the SG. I promise the next episode will not feature the SG, but it'll probably come back when we convert the other one into a fretless. So in the meantime, uh, let me know down below your thoughts on Gibson's QC, your thoughts on the SG bass, your thoughts on American made instruments versus overseas made instruments, all of that fun stuff. I'd appreciate it if you didn't call me a sellout or any of those things, but if you want to, go ahead. That's fine, that's what YouTube's for. We're all here for it, love it. Uh, but until next time, be safe. And I'll catch you next time. I don't never know how to end these things, so bye. <laughs>